everybody. We are going to talk about how to achieve and maintain a healthy CI with zero test flakes. Well, zero can be an exaggeration, but in the long term it is. My name is Antonio Ojea. I work at Google and NTL in SIG testing. And Hi, I'm Michelle Shepardson. I am a uh, senior software engineer at Google. And a chair of SIG and testing. Of SIG testing. <laughs> Hi, I'm Benjamin Elder. Uh, I'm a chair of SIG testing, Kate Simfra, and I'm on the Kubernetes steering committee. Okay. Okay, let's let's uh, understand what is the problem we're going to talk about, right? Flaky test. That's the worst nightmare of every project maintainer, every developer, or uh, we have dreams with that, right? It's flaky test is it passes. Sometimes, all the time doesn't pass. And there are several combinations of flaky tests, right? And several causes of flaky tests. There can be environment problems because our infra is overwhelmed and sometimes there can be that the test is lazy, especially if you are using Golang, Go routines, and channels, and all these, and locks. Uh, you know what I'm talking about, right? And the main problem is, if it's flaky, my code, is it good or is it bad? And that's the, the question that we make ourselves before the release. Can we release this uh, project with all these tests flaking or not? Our answer for that is clear. No, you cannot. But how we achieve this? Well, let's first understand better how Kubernetes project work, right? Kubernetes uh, project has a group, uh, special interest groups that can be horizontal or vertical. Horizontal mm, means that the scope is across different areas, and vertical means that they own some specific area, right? SIG testing, usually people that come to the project come with the mapping of their enterprises or companies or, or organizations and assume that SIG testing is the quality thing. Well, uh, spoiler alert, it is not. SIG testing is not about helping the other teams to write the test or review the test, no. It's in Kubernetes, every SIG owns their code, owns their area, and is in charge of collaborating with the other SIGs and understand the other SIGs. The goal of SIG testing is provide the tooling, provide the help, provide the experience, and this is how, in Kubernetes, we co collaborate each other to be able to achieve a, a zero flake policy. We implemented the, we also wrote, wrote down in our documentation that we have a zero flake policy, in, I think it was last year or something like that. So that's a big commitment in each SIG to not allow, not allow flakes. So, and how can you achieve that? One of the common misconceptions is to invest in only in testing, invest in only one area, right? And um, this is, is uh, problematic because then this creates fragmentation and creates uh, more role-focused people, right? I do the feature, you do the test, and the other people review the release. And this is another part that we are strongly against this. It's, as we said before, we, we base our development in solidarity, and the person there are persons with more skills to do one thing, and persons to do all skills for other things. And the, if we are able to collaborate and use these complementary skills, we achieve a perfect software product uh, with zero flakes. So when you are developing something, it, everything starts at the, at the design level. And that's when we have the cap. A lot of people complain about the cap. This is a lot of bureaucracy. I have a lot of nitpicking, whatever, right? But the thing is, this is the bar that we want to have. We need to understand what you want to achieve with Kubernetes. We need to understand how this is going to influence the other, the other components. It's not that you do a cap in SIG network and you don't talk with SIG node or with SIG API machinery. We need to be aware that what you are going to implement works, and you don't have the full context. So that's why there are people with more context that is going to ask you these tough questions. Then, 
during this step, we also ask, how are you going to test this? How is this going to work? How are you going to deal with upgrades? These are tough questions, but it's important because this is going to influence your fit. It's going to influence your design. And the other, this is just in the inception, right? Then you go through the development cycle, you go through the code reviews, and then we reach the time that it is released, it is working. What is the on another important step that you, that you in a project as a maintainer need to, to have? It's a strong policy for backports. Because there is a strong contention point because people don't want to agree. So what they want is to start to get all the features down to the release branches. We have a very strong policy in, in the backport. We only backport regressions, critical fixes, and we all go ask for a test because if this happened, why we didn't, why we weren't able to 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 see this problem, right? Then we need to put a test so it, it never happen again. And well, this is more about software development and, and philosophy, but that is the time that. You did everything well, but still you have flaky tests. How do you, how do you address this problem, right? So one important thing is how do you develop your test? There are these kind of tests that test 200 things at the same time. So when something fails, it can be 200 things plus the one that you don't know. So it's important that, that you make your test independent, right? It's what I'm testing, what I want to be sure that the what I want to assert or not to assert, right, can be negative testing. So design your test as you design your code. You need to get the, the right abstractions, you need to get the right test with the right uh, goals. So another important thing that is always, I wouldn't say always, but it's commonly neglected is the infra where the test run. Right. We have GitHub actions and we start to add tests and suddenly oh, it doesn't work, it's super low. Of course, you are consuming all the cores of the CPU. Infrastructure is important. It has to work. You need to monitor where the tests are running. You need to understand what are the expectations on, on your testing. You need to also try to run your test fast. Right? You need to have a good strategy to say, I want to be able to merge with uh, certain, certain assurance that my code, code is, is correct, but I also want to merge fast. If you need to send a pull request and you take like one day to get the results, that's terrible for the development impact. So a good testing strategy based on pre-summits, periodic jobs, and monitoring, Michelle and Ben are going to talk about the tooling later, is, is really important. And, I don't know, common lesson plans that we have from working in, in Kubernetes is, is and common problems are timing issues. Race conditions, dependencies, this, you can put a lot of effort during the development, but these are hard to know. We have some, how can I say, some snippets, some in documentation that will help you to, to, to identify this problem, right? We have a way to run stress tests, so you run the test multiple times in parallel to identify races. It's also Golang has a nice race detector that allows you to compile the test binary, so it detects all the races. So you need to, to invest in the tooling too. Um, well, with this, I just want to, I think that this is my, okay. I want to say that you need to sum all these things and encourage a, a culture of quality. This this picture is from Spain. It's uh, Aqueducto Segovia, Segovia Aqueduct, I don't know how to say in English. The thing is, it's, it's something that the Romans built, like, I don't know how many years ago, 300, without concrete, without anything. Are stones on top of any other stone? and it's still standing in the center of the city. 
So if you are able to build this culture of quality that every developer, every person in the project is able to talk with each other, is able to put this emphasis during the development to say, this is not going to fail. Forget about production ready. I had this question during this, this QCon. Is your code production ready? Everything Kubernetes has to be production ready. What's production ready? Are you doing to development for something that is not production ready? We need to build this culture in the organization. And once you build this culture, everything will start to get better. And well, yes, uh, now I'm, uh, I'm going to talk also to how do you build this, right? You need to have uh, infrastructure, you need to have pro, you need to have tooling, and these are the things that we are building in the community and testing to help the, the project. And Michelle now is going to take over and talk more about this. Yeah, hey folks. So Kubernetes project has a few things that are built under SIG testing and some other areas to kind of help tackle flakes. So let's start off actually with where you're commonly encountering these as a developer. So there's a few types of jobs that commonly run for tests. Uh, you might see these on your uh, PRs, pre-submits. These are usually going to be things like the unit tests or other things that are blocking submission. So if you're a developer and you're seeing failures here, it's usually a, oh, I'm not gonna be able to submit my code. Let me take a look at what's actually happening here. You can also see these in a few other places with things like post-submits, things that run after your PR merges. Um, these are usually a little bit harder to spot because at this point, your code's submitted. So you're not necessarily looking out for like, did something else also happen afterwards? <laughs> and there's also periodics. These are usually larger, more complex things that uh, aren't tied to a particular PR, but as it implies, run periodically at a particular time. So again, even harder to spot. These aren't necessarily linked to anything. You need something else in order to discover what's happening with the periodics. And then uh, common thing for the pre-submits, you might go in and say like, oh, my job failed, let me go and take a look at the details of the logs or the artifacts in order to try and figure out what happened here and what do I need to fix with my code. So we get the problem. Let's say that I've looked at the errors and it's uh, not quite clear, is this actually due to my code or is this due to a flaky test? Um, we need other clues uh, besides just the logs and the artifacts to actually tell what is happening here. So things like, do I have some signal that these kinds of failures have happened before? If so, where did they start? Are they affecting other jobs besides the one that failed? Um, in that case, we have a few different things within the Kubernetes project to kind of help tackle these with different approaches. So first up, and actually a pretty simple one to check, what if I would just wanna check if this uh, job has been failing before? Well, from the, uh, from the links from the pre-submit, for instance, you get the uh, logs in Prow, and then you can also go to the job history just for a quick overview of all of the recent uh, runs of that job. Um, so easily linked from the same place you're already looking for failures, but as you can kind of tell, limited on details. It will tell you what the status of the recent jobs are, when it ran, on what, et cetera, but it's not giving you details of the actual failures without going into every single one of these individually. It's not telling you what tests failed, um, and it's not giving you the additional details you need to look further in if these things are actually failing. So let's say that we do have failing things. What else would we look at for uh, checking the job history? We could also look at a more overview um, if we're looking for maybe like a job is failing, but I suspect that it might be related to something like your like infrastructure that I think might be causing uh, failures across maybe the whole project or maybe something more specific like a repo or cluster. In that case, there's also the overview uh, job status on Prow showing all of the recent uh, history. There's also uh, something that you can filter down and drill down into. Maybe I wanna check if there's something wrong more locally. Uh, again, kind of limited details. You can go back into the like specific logs for these jobs, but if you're doing this for a ton of jobs at once, this could be like a pretty slow manual process. So, uh, we get to test grid. TestGrid has a visual history of the job uh, history um, for a bunch of the running tests, et cetera. Uh, the grid view makes it easy to map the tests rows to the uh, columns, which are runs over time. 
So for instance, this is a, a view of the history of all of the uh, tests running in a particular job uh, over time, um, correlated with things like the time that they ran at, the commits that they run under, et cetera. Um, this makes it really easy to spot patterns over time. Visually, um, it's dense, and it's customizable to allow you to filter down a grid, either for the default view for all users, or at the time and point that you're debugging, to make it easy to have lenses on uh, that ad hoc debugging, trying to figure out exactly what is a, a root cause, what are patterns that I might want to investigate further into. So for this case, oh, actually, in this case, for instance, we could see that there are um, flakes happening. We have things that are not consistently a pass or fail. Um, but we can also see, uh, a little bit hard to see in this particular screenshot, but it's things that are happening on the overall status of the job, but not the tests running under them, which is a pretty classic indication of a flake. Um, there's also a few other things that are in test grid. I won't go over all the features, but um, different things to try and check the overall status of things at a glance to make it easier to drill into problems. If you remember me mentioning periodics before, where it's hard to find uh, exactly what's happening, for instance, this is a good place to check. Um, you don't have the status on like individual PR failures, for instance, but you can get the at a glance status if you're trying to, for instance, monitor the health of the overall tests of a SIG or the project. Um, it has the recent stats. It also gives you a quick view of, for instance, particular test rows uh, that may have failed. So yeah, back to that example earlier. We see that this one's flaky, but for overall and not for individual tests. We also have this example, which is flaky on the individual tests. We can see a lot of like overall failures, but there's also a lot of things that are clearly runs that are passing or failing, uh, rapidly switching between like individual runs. Um, there's another common thing that I call out here just because it is a pretty useful one for debugging here. Um, there's a little hidden feature in test grid where you can also click and drag between columns, and that will open up on GitHub the changes that have occurred between the two commits of those runs. So a common one, for instance, you're checking here where there's a clear boundary between all the tests passing, and then the tests starting to flake. Um, I could check the individual runs to try and see what happened, or I can start immediately with where I think might be the more useful place to investigate, which is checking between that failing or that flaking and then passing column and then getting all of the uh, GitHub commits that have in between there to try and figure out exactly what happened. Especially useful for things like the periodics, where a particular run may have caught some or many commits um, that are a difference between the uh, previous run. And then yeah, a lot of these are talking about like looking at the tests, uh, kind of monitoring, um, kind of a push model, um, where you are looking at the test at a point in time, but that's relying on you to like periodically check in on the tests yourselves. Um, so what if I want to uh, know when critical things are failing or uh, flaking? Well, there's configurable alerts in test grid to say like alert me when uh, a tab starts getting uh, failing rows. Um, those can be configured to also allow like it needs X number of passes in order to no longer be counted as a failing row. And then you can also get email alerts when that tab starts having failing rows. Um, a good way, for instance, for uh, a recent thing that we actually did have to check, which was a failure in Kettle, one of the underlying uh, tools for the next thing I'll get to. Um, but it's a good way to say, like, my SIG is invested in these particular jobs or tests passing, and I really want to make sure that we tackle it soon when we notice that that starts failing. And then lastly, one of the other tools that is uh, pretty critical here is triage. So this is uh, clustered failures by the failure message. Um, do you remember earlier we can go to the Prow UI to get the logs for the, um, for the particular failure in order to try and debug more? Triage gives an overview of the failures across a lot of the jobs, basically all of the jobs that have run recently. Um, and similar to the uh, overall view or the rest of these tools, you can filter by, for instance, SIG or other things in order to drill down into particular failures of interest. And I think this is pretty illustrative of why uh, triage is super useful. We have the summary of like the particular status that happened here, or the particular um, failure message, uh, a kind of an idea of occurrences uh, over time and also recently. And then we also have a, a clear graph with when those occurrences happen. So we can see that it uh, occasionally occurs, something that uh, just might pop up in the test sometimes. 
and then hit a sudden spike on the fifth. Um, and then we can also see actually that um, I believe somebody submitted a change around the time where the uh, spikes went down, resolving uh, the flake itself. Um, also, again, links back to Prow if you want to debug. Get a start here for debugging what some of the uh, recent examples might be with more logs to actually check the uh, cause. And um, to follow up on this, there's also, uh, you can file a bug from triage in order to have a sample of the same information that it has in GitHub and then start tracking more investigation, sharing with others, uh, et cetera. So yeah, tackling flakes is uh, something that is, um, needs a multi-pronged approach. We have a bunch of tools that kind of tackle this with different trade-offs in different ways. Um, those tools are interlinked. Uh, there's definitely improvements that can be made, but uh, notice all of those link back to the logs for debugging, prowlings out to its own overviews for uh, checking like quick history, um, test grid uh, links back to prowl, et cetera. Um, there's a bunch of uh, other things I didn't mention in there as well that like kind of make it easy to jump from tool to tool uh, going to the next uh, most useful place to investigate. Um, there's the push and pull models uh, where monitoring is useful for uh, checking on test health, especially over time as somebody invested in the health of the project overall and preventing these flakes, but also pull models to try and uh, get notifications to fix things when it's needed as quickly as possible. And then communication, things like being able to file bugs from triage, being able to link to any of these UIs to uh, share the failures with others, and uh, just kind of communicate across the project for having multiple people up to date on what's happening and helping to tackle these things together. And regardless, if we go back to that earlier pre-submit, um, let's say that I have my pre-submit failure and I want to debug it. Um, the best thing is just to know that we don't really have flakes. You can safely just look at that failure and say, what in my code probably could have caused this um, without having to worry about going down the rabbit hole of investigating everything else. So prevention over a cure. And uh, next up, I'll hand it over to Ben. I'm gonna quickly take a moment to plug uh, one thing that we forgot to mention here is that there's a release CI signal group in SIG release that is specifically looking across all of this, not in for any particular SIG, for the set of jobs that we know are really important to releasing the project that are really high quality, very reliable, and should not be failing. Um, one of the cool things about all those tools is that they give you different ways to drill down, you know, by the particular ones you're focusing on or with triage for failures that are happening across all of the jobs when we have some rare flake that you might not clearly introduce that if you looked in test grid, you don't see that signal. Um, and that we have these groups that are you know, focusing on their own tests, but also groups that are looking across the project to try to catch that sort of thing. Um, really big shout out to those folks. They do a lot of work to keep Kubernetes release high quality and to reach out and figure out who, who's the right domain expert for those you know, odd ones that the SIGs might have missed. So I'm gonna talk about the infrastructure. Um, this is a really important thing. Uh, a few years ago, our infrastructure was not reliable enough. And it's really hard to get people to pay attention to your test results and take seriously that you know they may be responsible for some change that's causing failures. If there's lots of failures that are not anyone's responsibility from any of their code and are from the underlying infrastructure. If your infrastructure can't be trustworthy, you're never gonna get people to take the quality seriously of the tests. You need developers to trust that when they see a job failing, that's a change in the code, it's a change in a test, it's not the environment. So one of the initiatives we took was to be able to run more hermetic testing in a lot of cases where we don't have to run a ton of external infrastructure. Uh, we built this tool called Kind. It lets us run clusters locally where the container nodes, so it's a Docker container that's a node that runs containers inside. Um, it has some of its own problems, but it allows us to be insulated from any external dependencies and something that you can replicate locally on your machine. Um, of course, we run Kubernetes CI on Kubernetes. Um, so we actually run a pod on Kubernetes, which is running Docker and Docker, or rather Docker and Containerd, and then we run uh, Containerd inside that. 
it's just we have no particular choice, but this is what the stack looks like for um, when we're running these kind jobs. And you might think, wow, that's pretty error prone. Well, it was initially, but it turns out the real problem that we tend to run into is IO contention. Um, if you are running k multiple Kubernetes control plane nodes on a machine that is itself running Kubernetes, and then you're hammering it with end-to-end -end tests, you are making a lot of I.O. on that machine, and you need to be careful about when you have these workloads that have a ton of I.O. making sure they're insulated. So we made a push to make sure that when we're running this kind of job, it's the only thing on the machine, and the machine has a very fast disk that can keep up with uh, all of the things that's happening here, not just the API server and etcd from all the writes from the tests, but also when we're doing image pulls and things like that, you can wind up with a lot of disk read and write, and um, you're gonna hit the limits on the underlying machine, and then that's gonna cause tests to flake that has nothing to do with the tests or the code, it's just the underlying infrastructure can't keep up, especially if you wind up co-locating two of these things that are really write heavy. So you need to avoid resource contention. You need to make sure that the resource contention is not from the underlying infrastructure as opposed to some kind of bug in the code. So we made a big push. Um, Kubernetes's CI has been around for a long time. It's this DIY thing that moved from Jenkins to running on Kubernetes itself. We had a GK 1.4.6 cluster with ABAC, um, and it's been upgraded in place ever since. So a lot of the things that are best practices today were not happening. Um, it was running inside of Google for a long time on kind of the unlimited Google Cloud money faucet instead of the <laughs> donations through the community. And no one was setting requests and limits on their jobs. We were just had a really big pool of VMs and throw all the pods at it. That does not work. If you're testing things in CI, you need some kind of guarantee of like how much resources is this thing getting. You need that to be consistent or you're gonna have flakes from that. So we enforce that every CI pod has to set requests and limits. They should match. You should have guaranteed quality service. I'm not sure if I would recommend that for all of your production workloads, but for CI tests, that consistency is really important um, and it allows us to run the infrastructure effectively as well. You need to consider your I.O. needs. You should really find some tooling that works for your platform to monitor um, I.O. heavy workloads and proactively look for that. Um, we've spent some time in testing, digging through this sort of thing to say, oh, well, certain kinds of build tools or certain kinds of test tools are going to do a lot of I.O. and you're just like, you're running on an underlying machine. Uh, you can't schedule for this currently in Kubernetes. So we do things like putting things in memory, making sure it's the only workload on a machine and that the disk is fast enough and knowing that the test is not failing because it's I.O. starved because of some other workload on the machine. Measure, measure, measure. You need to be checking this. You need to be looking at this proactively and catching, oh, hey, our CI machines are getting starved for I.O. and we're co-locating workloads. This is a problem. I also want to mention for anyone here that's writing things to go, that's a lot of the cloud native community, um, go max prox when you're doing this is not, the default is not aware of container limits. Um, so if you have things that are doing a lot of Go routines with locks and whatnot, you can have contention there that uh, is actually because you're not aligning the Go runtime with the amount of resources you're actually providing. You can use the downward API in Kubernetes to pass through the CPU limit as this environment variable. Um, there's a library from Uber called Auto Max Prox that you can import. We're using a mix of approaches in the Kubernetes project to try to avoid things like our unit tests flaking because we're running them highly parallel and they're doing Go routines and locks and things. And it's on a machine with lots of cores, but we're running the unit tests with, I don't know, four of them. And so then Go is seeing the underlying CPUs and trying to use all of them. You have to look out for this sort of thing that again, isn't something that someone writing a unit test is thinking about. It's just the intersection of the tests running on the underlying infrastructure. The other thing to watch out for, we mentioned we're running Docker and Docker. Well, that's privileged containers. They're even leakier than normal containers. But even for normal containers, if you're running CI with containers, you have to watch out for there are a number of things that aren't really contained. Um, off the top of my head, two big ones bin format misc, if you're making things run cross architecture, um, if you've ever run an ARM image on an AMD host or vice versa, that's usually being done with this neat little hack where you tell the kernel, hey, 
use this user space emulator when you're running binaries that look like ARM64. That's registered in a global API in the kernel when exec calls happen, go out to this interpreter. If you are setting this up in parallel on a CI machine, you can race on registering these handlers. Um, so watch out for that sort of thing. You could consider running it as a daemon set, or you can make sure that those workloads are not scheduling at the same time. Um, they will race each other on this API, or I notify limits where even if you don't have a privileged container, the limits themselves are global to the machine. They're not namespace, like something like file handle limits. And it's pretty easy to run into this when you're running like a lot of kubelets with kind or something like that. Um, some automation tools out there uh, that are trying to watch for files. Um, it's pretty easy to hit this. You might not be aware of it. The error messages might look like you're running out of file handles, but if you do a little digging, you'll find that, oh, but this tool is using iNotify. Uh, so we bump the iNotify limits pretty high on all of our CI machines because we just know that we're gonna have a lot of things using this, so we just preemptively make sure that there's plenty of capacity for running this, and they're not gonna run in this artificial limit. The other thing is, while we've done all this stuff to try to run things within the CI as much as possible and keep it really hermetic and reliable locally, um, that's not sufficient for developing Kubernetes. Uh, Kubernetes, the open source project, advertises a 5,000 node scaling target. That's important even if you're not running to 5,000 nodes to get some idea of the systemic scaling of the project and the reliability and the stability. So we actually test 5,000 node clusters in the cloud. You're not gonna run a kind cluster on some eight core VM with 5,000 nodes. You're gonna melt the machine. So we run 5,000 VMs plus a control plane in the cloud on a regular basis. If you are doing that sort of thing, now you have a big problem where you have a ton of resources outside of the CI system and you can't let those get starved or, or, or something that we used to run into. Uh, things would just say, oh, this is the GCP project where you run the tests. Uh, when you start the test, spin up the cluster and delete the cluster at the end of the test. But if your test pod gets preempted and it fails to clean up, now you have 5,000 node cluster just sitting there consuming all of the quota in the project. So we have this little state machine system with a couple of microservices where if you want to use something like a GCP project or an AWS sub-account, we're going to lease it to you from a clean state to a busy state where you're running jobs. You're going to have a TTL on that and you're going to heartbeat from the job to say, hey, I'm still using this. If you fail to heartbeat, we hit the TTL. There's another service that will move it into the dirty state that this project isn't currently being used but we need to make sure that we clean up all those resources so that the next time we hand out this project, there won't be leftover 5,000 node clusters eating up all the quota. Um, and then finally, when we run a tool that just wipes everything in the account or the, cluster or the GCP project, then we move it into the clean state available to be leased to the next one. And again, to drive confidence in this and make sure that we can drive that you know, culture of quality, we first have to make sure that this is reliable, we have enough resources, we're monitoring it. You're not gonna run into CI starting to fail very often because we ran out of resources. We're proactively uh, staying on top of tracking that we have enough projects, we're not getting low on them, we're not getting stuck cleaning up. Um, we've made a pretty big push to try to make sure that as much as possible, we never hit that state so that you can focus on making sure that the tests themselves are reliable. So in conclusion, eliminating flaky tests is crucial for achieving a robust CI pipeline. You need a holistic approach to quality, starting with design and code reviews. You need to think upfront, how do we build things so that they aren't going to be flaky? You need collaboration and shared responsibility. Don't tell one group that they're gonna be responsible for every aspect of testing. You're gonna burn them out and you're not aligning the thinking about how do we build these things to be reliable. The people who are building the features are the people that know how to test the features and they know where the problems are gonna be. And you need to do that in collaboration with other people that may be experts in like the test framework or the infrastructure. <laughs> Adopting best practices and leveraging all these tools can let you build this high quality software like the Kubernetes project strives for. And remember, only you can prevent CI fires. You can find us on GitHub, uh, primarily in the Kubernetes Test Info Project where we have all of the configuration for what we're running. Um, you can find us in the Kubernetes Slack. You can get an invite at slack.kates.io. 
to the SIG testing channel. We have a bi-weekly meeting at 10 a.m. Pacific. Uh, the SIG testing channel has the link in the agenda. Thank you. Any questions? We might be out of time, sorry. Well, you can come meet us afterwards. We'll step outside. Thank you all.